everybody and welcome to the Family Matters interview series. Uh, it's six o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all for choosing to join the presentation. We're so happy to have you here with us tonight. Um, just a few reminders that all lines will be muted throughout tonight's presentation. So if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and a member of the BCAT team will respond to you within two to three business days. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Dr. William Mansbach to discuss the 15 for Me program, reducing caregiver stress and supporting wellness. Dr. Mansbach is the founder and chief executive officer of Mansbach Health Tools, which supports the BCAT Research Center. He is also the chief executive officer and president of Counterpoint Health Services, a multidisciplinary behavioral health care company specializing in geriatrics and dementia care. For many years, he was the chief operating officer of the largest geriatric behavioral health care company in the U.S., specializing in long-term care. Dr. Mansbach has an international reputation as a researcher, clinician, and consultant in the aging field. He was a pioneer in the development of memory clinics and is the creator of the BCAT and Enrich systems, which integrate cognitive tests, interventions, and dementia prevention programs. He is the co-author of the award-winning book, Brain Health As You Age, a practical guide to maintenance and prevention. Dr. Mansbach's most recent peer-reviewed articles can be found on the BCAT Research Center page. Joining Dr. Mansbach is Lynn Young, the Vice President of Operations at Mansbach Health Tools. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our Family Matters interview series. Today, we are joined by Dr. William Mansbach. Welcome, Dr. Mansbach. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. Hello. And we're really excited for today's topic to hear more about um, caregiver stress and how that really impacts um, the overall wellness of the caregivers who are out there providing support every day, day in and day out to their family members um, who may have cognitive impairment and or dementia. I know you're going to share some details today about um, a new program called 15 for Me and kind of talk us through a little bit what goes on with, with um, caregivers who are kind of enduring that sustained stress level when they're working so hard to take care of a loved one. So we're looking forward to this topic today. Great, well, thanks for having me. Of course. So let's start with, you know, that topic of, you know, when caregivers are working, you know, day in, day out, taking care of, supporting a loved one, sometimes people are doing this with no help at all or very little mm -hmm. help. Um, often they don't have the opportunity to take breaks or vacations or days away from caregiving. How does this demanding um, routine really impact people's stress level who are kind of in this process? Well, uh, it's a great question, certainly one to be in this conversation, Lynn. Um, and, and there is never enough help, I think, you know, for, for caregivers. Uh, it's estimated that to properly care for, let's say, an older adult in the community who has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, that it takes three people. Uh, wow. And so... If there's only one person, it's 3x the burden. So certainly uh, it's really difficult. One of the phenomena that's particularly interesting, I think for caregivers, uh, painful probably, uh, more interesting for us, more painful for them. It, when you take care of an older adult uh, who has dementia on a day-to-day -day basis, you're observing, you're very much engaged uh, in um, the day-to-day -day experience of caring for that person. And, and you become very sensitized to changes in memory, uh, up and down and things of that sort. But one of the things that's um, been recently documented, but not necessarily well known, Lynn, is that caregivers also over time tend to begin to question their own cognitive abilities, not just their stress level, not just their mood. And in fact, uh, being a caregiver is a risk factor for developing dementia also. So what mitigates that is getting um, into a routine where you can reduce the stress itself. And then the risk factor is, um, is well, it's greatly uh, reduced. 
those are some scary statistics that you're sharing. It's really eye opening to think about doing the work of three people when you're just one person. And then the risk factors mm-hmm. that, that all of that time and effort is sort of associated with increased risk for the caregiver as well. Well, Lynn, and, and also I would say this is that caregivers notoriously say, I don't have time to get help for myself, or I don't have time to attend um, maybe a support group. Uh, it's so important to broaden the team. It's mandatory that one takes care of oneself. You've said this before, I know, and it's certainly true. Caring for a loved one with dementia is not a sprint. It is a marathon. So how do you prepare for a marathon? You have to stop along the way. You have to refuel. You need support. You need some guidance. And no one can do it alone. Uh, No woman, no man is an island uh, unto themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good analogy. I imagine as these caregivers are putting in the work, this is taking a toll on them, you know, wear and tear on their bodies, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, as you mentioned, mood, I'm sure this is a stressor, you know, mentally as well as physically. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, with all these elevated levels of stress, what, are there any health concerns associated with, you know, prolonged stress like this? You know, uh, I think a good paradigm or a good model for people to think about is uh, a neurophysiological one. What what happens to the body when we experience sustained stress? It doesn't just have to be caregiving, but caregiving is a perfect example. So our bodies are equipped with certain stress hormones, Lynn, that help us cope, help us respond to uh, the here and now to immediate situations. We've all heard of the fight or flight response. If you're walking down a dark alley and you get a sense that someone's behind you, immediately your body changes, your heart rate and your respirations increase. Um, In fact, your muscles become energized in a way that uh, they normally aren't. And there are many other things that occur. And that's fine and good in the short run, but sustained stress, actually produces negative effects for the body. And and maybe the culprit that we can identify the most is cortisol. Cortisol is a naturally occurring hormone in our body, a substance in our body. It helps um, deal with uh, inflammation and things like that in the the short run, but in the long run, it causes damage. So um, the damage can be cognitive, Uh, so it can impair memory. And maybe that's one reason why caregivers are more at risk for developing dementia themselves. But it also can affect other parts of our body, Uh, our GI system in particular. The caregivers tend to report more somatic complaints, headaches, GI distress, back pain. It tends to exacerbate conditions they already have, um, accelerating the aging process in certain ways. Once again, it can be mitigated But there, uh, aside from the psychological issues that we can talk about, there are physiological issues that are very real and must be addressed. Yeah, those are all really legitimate concerns. And I think people think they're doing the right thing, right? By by not asking for help, not being a burden, trying to do it all themselves. What they may actually be doing is putting their health at risk, it sounds like, just from that overload of having all that additional stress. So I think about it this way, uh, burden with uh, uh, uppercase B, you know, a capital B, you want to move that to a lowercase B. And the only way you can do that is to get help. And uh, it, it, it could be familial, you could be asking family members, but sometimes there isn't a family member there. Or we tend to say about an adult child, a son or a daughter, maybe who lives in a different geographical area, they're too busy, they're raising their own kids, whatever the case may be. Sometimes we need to push against that. Sometimes we need uh, to get help that's not familial, that's professional help. Uh, I don't just mean a therapist to talk with, but I mean actually someone to come in to give us respite, to get us, uh, give us an opportunity to get out of the house, uh, do simple things like go to the grocery store, you know, maybe even do laundry, things of that sort. But, uh, but maybe even in a more restorative way, do something that works against that cortisol. They're called parasympathetic activities. You know, you want to do things that make you feel good in some ways. If nothing else, maybe a program like, um, well, like the 15 for me program where you can reduce stress as we'll talk about. That sounds like a great idea. I know I can imagine caregivers saying, I don't have a lot of free time. So 
you know, how will I have time to dedicate to my own health when I'm working so hard to take care of somebody else's health? Um, if they do have minimal time in their day, can you tell us a little bit about um, how can 15 for me, how can that program provide them with the, the stress relief and the overall wellness benefits, but also in a short window? Because I imagine they only have short blocks of time available to kind of dedicate to their own health and wellness. So there's a secret that the exercise industry does not tell you. And the secret is to um, create and maintain restorative or a healthy um, kind of effect for the body and for the mind, you need about 10 to 15 minutes a day. You don't need to go to the gym for an hour. That may feel good. And in no way am I minimizing that, but caregivers can't do that for the most part. Right. And they don't need to do that for the most part. So I would say 10 minutes a day, 15 is best, hence the name 15 for me for our program. Um, five days a week, if not every day. And it doesn't have to be all at one time, Len. Somebody could say, well, I just don't have 15 minutes at one time. That's fine. Do you have 10 minutes here, five minutes there, four minutes here? So you can spread it out during the day. I would challenge most people who would say, well, Dr. Mansbeck, I don't have 15 minutes in a day. I think that's a question of efficiency, not opportunity. I think most people do have that opportunity. But sometimes you can take a step back and look at it. In particular, with the flexibility that you're discussing, you know, having short amounts of time here and there to total up to 15, that seems pretty reasonable, you know, fairly doable. Most people can pull together a few minutes here and a few minutes there. So that's exciting that, you know, it doesn't have to be a big block of time. So right. tell me a little bit about you know, what are they doing in that 15 minutes? What kinds of, you mentioned exercises, um, sure. what kinds of things can they do in that 15 minutes to help with that stress reduction and that overall wellness? Well, our, uh, at our research center, you know, our, our, what our team is, uh, our team started with the science lab. We looked at, okay, so what, what really is restorative? What reduces stress? What reverses cortisol and things of that sort? And it turns out that you can put all those activities into three categories or three bins. Uh, there, there are cardio activities, there are cognitive activities, and there are what we call centered breathing activities. You might think about them as diaphragmatic breathing, um, meditative practices, meditation, things of that sort, belly breathing, I think is another term that people are familiar with. Um, not all activities are equal. For example, um, especially with, with, uh, with cognitive, not all like doing a crossword puzzle may be fun and that's great. It's not necessarily a, the kind of cognitive exercise that we're talking about. In fact, you could argue that these three categories, cardio, cognitive, center breathing, not only do they reduce stress, but they're also brain healthy and they have to meet both criteria. So. If it's brain healthy and it reduces stress, then it counts as one of the three C's. We tried to balance uh, time, right? So that's parsimony with validity. And um, so within these three categories, there, there are a number of offerings that you can do from an app, which you probably asked me about. Um, seems like everything's from an app these days. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to make it efficient so that people don't have to waste any time. They can get right to it. They don't have to drive anywhere to do something. They don't need special equipment to do it. If you have a smartphone, you can do 15 for me. That's, that's really simple and easy. Just do it right from your fingertips, you know, when you have a little break in your day. I think a lot of people know what physical activity is all about, right? Everyone's learned the benefits of getting up and getting moving. And I think probably everyone's heard of meditation. I would imagine some of our family members on the, on joining us tonight may not know much about the cognitive component, those cognitive sure. exercises that you're talking about. Can you, can you give us some examples or, of what might be included or what they might expect to do to, to kind of get that extra benefit for their brain health? That sounds like an, a wonderful additional support for mitigating those risks that we talked about earlier. Well, you are right. I think people know that, well, cardio could be uh, power walking or walking up and down stairs and things of that sort. And sure, we're pretty prescriptive about how we do it, but lots of options and so forth. 
cognitive is a is a kind of a mysterious category. Uh, even defining well, what is cognitive? Does that mean it's about memory? Is it about executive functions? Is it about attention? Really, what is it? So, our exercises focus on something called working memory exercises. So, this is a specific type evidence-based, what I mean by that is that it's been validated by science to reduce stress and to improve, improve brain health. And they're very specific exercises that you would find here that you wouldn't find in a newspaper. It's not a crossword puzzle. It's not brain search or word searches or anything of that sort, word, word scrambles in and of themselves. I mean, those are nice. They really are in no way am I minimizing them but they don't do quite the same thing. They're not quite as effective as what you're really looking at. So working memory exercises, they would be exercises that require you to attend and focus uh, to, a, to a very significant degree and bring some sort of cognitive or mental process in, into play. And I'll give you one example. Uh, in our program, in 15 for me, there's something called flip the image, flip the image. Now, this was created by our researchers, validated by our researchers. Um, you won't find this in other places because it's, it's, we designed it, it's pretty unique. And what happens in Flip the Image is, is that there's a design that a person looks at. Again, you can look at it from your phone or any device, it could be a laptop if you wanna do that. Uh, and then in your head, you have, to, you have to flip the image that you see and pick from three other alternatives, well, what one matches it in some way. Sometimes it's flipping it vertically, sometimes it's side to side, and they get increasingly complicated and increasingly complex. It is fun to do. Uh, you can start at the most basic level, almost anybody can do it. And then if you want, you can challenge yourself and get really um, to, to high difficulty. But that's an example of a working memory exercise. Oh, I love that. That sounds like a lot of fun. And if you're getting fun. the extra brain boost, you know, all the better. I mean, again, these folks have very short windows of time. So you want to get the most benefit from the exercise or activity of your choice. And Lynn, I, I should say that um, for those of you who are watching, who may be wondering, the, the, the structures of the brain uh, that get activated in doing working memory exercises support or improve not only memory, but they actually project to where mood is processed, including stress. So in a real way, doing working memory exercises improves memory and cognition, but it also improves mood. And, and in that respect, it reduces stress and there's a neurophysiological link. So we already know why working memory exercises do in fact work. So when you say mood, would that be something like anxiety? Because I know a lot of caregivers report they're highly anxious. You mm -hmm. know, it's hard for them to relax. They're always on alert. Would that be a benefit tied to mood? Sure. So, so as, a, as a mental health and a memory doctor, I would say um, depression and anxiety are, are, are what we refer to as the mood siblings, right? I mean, um, they're very common uh, and among caregivers, extremely common. So um, just to give you an idea, the base rate or, or sort of the occurrence rate, how common is it that someone who's a caregiver uh, is, um, could be clinically depressed, it's more than 50%. Um, it's, it's between 60 and 70% for people who have anxiety, to, to have anxiety if you're a caregiver. It doesn't mean you have it all the time, but the risk factors are, are higher. So working memory exercises, if you do that on your own, not only are you uh, improving your brain health, protecting yourself against developing your own dementia, but you're actually improving your mood. So it's not just psychologically enjoying what you're doing, which does happen. It's sort of a double approach, but at the level of the brain, you're improving uh, or reducing depression and anxiety. Well, this is a lot of benefits for a short amount of time. So this is just a hand, you could have your phone in your hand, and yep. you would be able to go through and select from the three choices that you mentioned, the physical activity or the cardio, the cognitive or the centered breathing activities. We, and, and let me just say, I mean, what we learned was that um, what works the best, Lynn, is a person decides, well, today, maybe I'm going to do cardio or cognitive. You can choose. Do that for 10 to 12 minutes and then finish with doing centered breathing. It just gives you that extra boost that uh, reduces stress, 
reduces that, those cortisol levels. You don't have to do it that way. If you want to just do cognitive or just do cardio, you can. Or if you just want to do a series of, um, or, or even one centered breathing video, do that. But if you want that, that double combination, do cardio or cognitive first and then finish it with doing a centered breathing exercise. For, so you, know, you can alternate. It sounds like you could do cognitive one day and then centered or cardio another and go back and forth like that each time as as long as you know you have some of that centered breathing mixed in. It sounds like a really nice mix of variety and different interest areas. Yes. So there's something for everybody. Well, sustainability is important. So. What we really want people to do is, is integrate this into their life. If they only do cardio, uh, they're going to get, after a while, maybe they're going to get tired of that. But if they mix it with, and, and the cognitive in particular is interesting, Lynn, because the exercises are what we call interactive and randomized. So every time you do them, even if it's the same type of exercise, it's a different exercise. So something called memory match. Uh, it's very popular. It's a lot of fun. But each time you do memory match, even if it's the same level, level one, you know, or exercise one, set one, it's a different experience each time you do it. And, and there are thousands of combinations. So it's a lot of fun in that respect. That sounds wonderful. Um, can we go back to centered breathing? I know people know the term meditation. Maybe they've heard of it or maybe seen somebody on TV or you know, talking about it among friends. But I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that don't really understand what centered breathing or meditation looks like? And then what are, what are the benefits? You mentioned that it helps you sort of decompress. Can you tell us a little bit more about that third C or that, that final piece in the, um, in the flow of the exercises? How does that work? Center breathing is a technique really to stay in the moment. If you think about it uh, from a caregiver standpoint, actually for anyone, we feel anxious when we're in the grip of the future, when we're thinking about, well, what do we need to do now? And what if this happens? And what if this doesn't happen? Anxiety uh, is associated with future events. Uh, so we need to move our mind to just focusing on what we're doing right now. And one way of doing that is to focus on our breathing. So for our center breathing videos from your phone, uh, we, we offer the most basic ones for people who have never done it before to more advanced ones. So it doesn't really matter what your level is. We want everyone to be comfortable. Uh, and we give them an opportunity to just be in the moment. And what happens is that respiration slows, heart rate slows, and what gets activated in the body is what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's our quieter you know, like quieter with quotes, uh, kind of hormones or chemicals like serotonin. So center breathing uh, through 15 for me, you can watch a video. Most people just listen to it, but you can watch it if you want. Someone will guide you through part of it, but you don't have to do words if you don't want to be guided. And you just learn how to focus on your breathing, stay centered and in the moment, and you only have to do it for a few minutes. And this isn't something that you have to do for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Anyone can learn how to do it. And um, that's, that's important. I can think of multiple scenarios throughout everyone's day where this could come in handy. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> for sure. Um, I know we're almost out of time, but you mentioned um, that this can be done in about 15 minutes a day. That's, that doesn't seem like much of a window to get all of these things accomplished. So I just wanted to ask the question, is that enough time to really achieve all of these stress reducing benefits, that short 15 minute segment? It is. So it goes back to the science, not just because we say so, but the evidence is really clear that, that it's the case. But don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In other words, uh, sometimes maybe you have 10 minutes and that's all you have that day. Maybe you want to spend an hour doing it. You can. You know, using the 15 for Me app, you can do some other exercise and just add it into the app if you want, and you can kind of get credit for it. So you can set actual goals. You can say, well, I want to do X number of minutes per week or X number of um, different exercises, you know, per week, and, and that, gets, uh, that gets tracked. You can even do a stress temperature when you begin it to say, how stressed am I? Something called the M5. 
it's all available, part of the app. You, you can repeat it whenever you want. Uh, when people see uh, that their stress level is coming down in almost quantifiable terms, it makes you even less stressed. It's kind of a, an, a you know, reassuring. A, it, it is very, it's very reassuring. You know, when we piloted 15 for me, Lynn, we really wanted to roll it out to people who were in stressful situations, who self-identified as stress. And what we found is somewhere close to about 85% of respondents said that it really indeed re reduced their stress. Um, overwhelming numbers said they would refer, you know, it to, you know, to friends or colleagues or so forth. And increasingly it's being used in the workplace as a way of reducing stress. So, so whether you're a caregiver, uh, or an employee or both, which many people are, uh, this might actually be a good tool for, for you to use. It sounds amazing. And I think it's going to be a really great resource for our family members who are looking for something simple, quick, but beneficial that will help them sort of navigate this journey and, and have a tool in their toolbox to reduce their stress and to help maintain their overall health. They're, they're not really much help to others if they themselves aren't well and exactly. staying healthy. So it's it's a you know kind of a obvious choice to you know ultimately take care of your own health as well. Mm -hmm. Where can folks find out more information about this program if they're looking for something like this? There's a website. Uh, it's called enrichvisits.com. We, we recommend this website because it's, we, we refer to it as consumer facing. And what we mean by that is, as you know, at the BCAT, we have a lot of tests and tools for healthcare professionals, but we're really concerned about patients and especially concerned about their family members. So on this website, there at the header banner, you can click on 15 for me and learn about it. But I would also say for caregivers, if you're concerned about your stress level, you can do the M5 for free. It's right on there. If you're worried about your cognition, you can do something called my mem check. Again, it's, it's a free tool, very good science. It will give you an idea of, you know, how are you doing cognitively? And do indeed uh, take something called the enriched calculator, which identifies, well, what are what are brain healthy and also stress reducing activities that I can do? And how often am I, how, how well am I doing, you know, in terms of those kinds of things. So enrichvisits.com is just a resource, but 15 for me actually lives there. So people can find out about it there. Excellent. So that's enrich, E-N-R-I-C-H visits.com. Yeah, one word. Perfect. Well, this has been really informational and I hope helpful to our caregivers hope out so. there. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today and sharing all this great information about the Enrich site and the, the 15 for Me program. Um, we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Lynn. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. We hope to have you back another day. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Thanks Bye. so much. Take care. Thanks, everybody, for joining our call tonight. Bye-bye. All right, uh, we would like to take this opportunity to invite you to become a member of the Enrich Brain Health Program by signing up on our Enrich website, if you haven't already. Um, that's the same website where 15 for Me is available. It's enrichvisits.com. And if you're interested in more information from the BCAT Research Center, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And I have those links up on the screen for you now. Again, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and a member of the BCAT team will respond to you via email within the next two to three business days. Um, I just want to thank everybody again for joining this episode of the Family Matters series, and we hope to see you again for our next episode in July to discuss my loved one seems more confused and my primary care doctor is recommending a neurocognitive evaluation. What information will this provide and how will it inform next steps? And the registration page for the next six episodes in the series will be available soon. If you are a member of the Enrich um, email subscription, you'll see that email come out very soon. I'm just gonna leave the meeting open for a couple more minutes in case anybody has any questions. And otherwise, I hope you have a great night.